last couple of years, three years actually, the, uh, the anti-trafficking police, NGOs, three NGOs, have worked since WIPOC. They've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and they've rescued one girl. You know, people say education. If we just educate them, if we just get them good jobs, if we do development, well, hell, millions of dollars have been spent on both and the situation continues to get worse. I mean, we, what proof do we need? Is education and development solved evil in the West? I mean, what has that done? Nothing. We have all the evidence in the world that education and money does not get rid of evil. It isn't a money and education issue. It's a moral, it's a spiritual issue. What we began to realize was even a greater challenge than rescuing the girls was restoring them once they'd been rescued. In fact, we found that most girls, even after they've been rescued, uh, still suffer with nightmares of their former life, which makes coping with everyday life pretty unbearable. How many women do you know that have been brutally abused who never leave therapy? It's a former pastor who did counseling. I can tell you most of the women continue in counseling the rest of their life. And they'll tell the story in detail and they'll talk about it, but they're thinking. They're re and thinking, really, you could change that word to faith. What they really believe doesn't change. And to really change that, it takes more than a counselor. It takes more than the words of a staff that's going to come alongside the girl and say, you're really good, this is good. Because remember, the world out there, the world they live in, are telling them they're trash. What was really going on inside? I hated myself. I hated myself so much and I started to think that my mother was right about never accept, accepting me like, like her daughter, that it wasn't worth it to live anymore. You know, there's only one thing what it does, it, it destroys your, your body, it, it destroys your life, your thoughts, your heart especially. That's what you start to feel and truly spiritually believe in your heart, that you are just a whore, that you're just a prostitute that you're no good, that as soon as you get older, as soon as you get fat, as soon as there's a wrinkle on your forehead, that no one's gonna want you. And regardless of you getting paid, no money is worth the disgrace and the shame and the destruction that it does to a woman's heart and soul. It is devastating, trust me. I knew that there was something wrong. I felt almost subhuman and I was very ashamed. I was frightened to tell anybody that I couldn't feel love or I couldn't feel compassion or anything like that, you know, because I thought there was something wrong with me. What was so tragic is that many of the girls who had been rescued were retreating back to prostitution just to regain a sense of normalcy. Why a woman would choose to stay in a situation where she is being abused, why is that? If they, even when they're offered alternatives, why? Why would they choose to stay? And I've, I've often said that the, the abuse that we know the, the, um, is sometimes better than the future that we don't know. We know by the statistics that you take a girl out of prostitution, 96 out of 100 within a year are back in it, unless deep, profound care over a lengthy period of time is provided to be able to begin to restore that sense of dignity and future for that child. I'd rather like not ever do it again because I feel like every time I sold my body to somebody, I was like selling my soul. Like I was, every time I worked, it was just like, you know, a piece of me is going every single time. And I was tired of having that like empty feeling inside of my body, like inside of my, my body, you know, inside of my soul. Let me tell you the story of one girl. For two months, every single day, this big, fat ex-Marine rapes this little 12-year-old girl. You know, she writes in her, she, she, she writes her story out. It's part of our therapy. She writes her story out, and she says how worthless she knew she was then. She said, I know I'm now I'm just a piece of garbage, and my life is ruined. And why does he do this to me? Why would he do this to me? Hopelessness is just like, it's such a weak word. 
such a weak word for what she feels. It's beyond hopeless to, uh, I mean, do you ever feel guilty about something you've done? Right, you never, and, and maybe sometime you, I felt really guilty before. Well, if you can imagine the worst you've ever felt for something you, the very worst, multiply it by 10 and live like that for a year or two. Every day, feeling that pain and thinking that's what you're worth, that's what your life is, and not understanding how this could happen to you. How could, how could this happen to me? What type of emotions did you feel? The way you're experiencing during that time? Intense fear. Intense fear. Um, <laughs> a real rejection. A feeling totally unloved. I'm wanted. I'm cared for. totally lost within myself. And so that's when the heavy, heavy cocaine abuse came in, and I just wanted to disappear. I remember just lighting that pipe and just looking forward to that hit. All of a sudden, I heard my ears just ringing really loud, and like everything went black. Like my eyes just shut down. My eyes were wide open, but it went black, and I fell back. And um, I was having a heart attack. The pain in my chest was like, my heart was going and it was like, I felt like somebody was stabbing me with a knife in my heart, but I couldn't see anything. And all I could remember was that, it, it, you know, there was nothing but blackness around me. And just, I realized, crap, I'm dying. I'm dying. And all I could remember is Jesus. That's all I could think about was God. And I saw my life literally flash before my eyes. And as I called upon his name, I just said, Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> I'm, I'm alone. I'm sorry. And come and get me. Save me from myself. I'm sorry. And all I could do was like say sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was a prostitute. I was so ashamed. And the ambulance came. They took me in the hospital. And the doctor came over and said, um, do you know how lucky you are? You have a lot of drugs in your system, lady. And you're allergic to narcotics. And he's like, God's with you. And I knew, I knew that um, Jesus heard my prayer. I was in such despair and desperation. I would really cry out to God, you know. And then one night, he appeared to me in a dream. I would go into this beautiful garden and sat on the bench was the Lord Jesus. And I would go to him, we would sit, and we would just talk about, I don't even know what we spoke about, but he never, ever once condemned me. I said, Jesus, I just want to see you. I want to know what you look like. I don't care about the movies I've seen. I just want to see you. I want to talk to you, I want to see you. And so he granted my request. I had a dream of him one night. And he came to me, and he didn't look anything like any picture any person I've ever seen before. He was the most handsome man I've ever seen, beautiful. And he came to me and went this close to my face and looked into my eyes and read me from my baby until my perfect age that I was. Everything I've done didn't say a word to me and looked at me with love in his eyes like, I love you. It was such beauty and such love that emanated from him. I was just... Right, I fell at his feet. I, I was like a dead person. And believe me, at that particular point in my life, I wasn't scared of much, but I, I was... And it wasn't like a fear he's going to hit me. It was like who he was, who he really is. And I fell at his feet and I just was... I just cried and I said, Lord, I'm so sorry 
for what I've done. And when I got up, he'd say, Helena, I'm waiting for you. And uh, it was so beautiful, so, so gentle. And that went on for about six months. And I, 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 I was always waiting for him to say a harsh word or condemn me. We didn't. He said, I love you. You're healed, you're whole, you're delivered. And just like this fire was lit in me. And I just started to weep. And I just realized, God loves me. No matter what I've done, no matter all the mistakes I've made, no matter how many people I've hurt, he still loves me, and he can make something of my life. To think that he's, he, he took me, I was nothing. I was late, when he found me, I was laying in a bed. I hadn't had a bath for a year. I was covered in abscesses where I'd uh, skin pop stuff, I'd miss veins, I'd cut myself. I was stinky, I was smelly, I was rotten. And he took me and he made me something beautiful. And to me, that is so wonderful. That is so worth giving my life to. And I just, oh, I just think he is so wonderful. And I don't want to stop talking about him because my heart just fills with joy. Oh, and I just want everybody to know about him, you know? I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. He loves you. Oh, I know he loves me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know he loves me. And it's real. He's jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me It's a happy ending to the story. <laughs> okay, she gets rescued. She comes to us. And uh, she begins to realize that she is a child of God, that she's a princess a daughter of the king. <laughs> and and it, when she finished her therapy, she said, you know, she goes, now I know the truth about me. You know, God loves me. And I have so many people here who love me that I, I must, there must be something good about me. And I know that if I just try hard, I will have a great future that God will give me a great future no matter what happened in my past. God made it possible for me to get out of this world. He's loving me even though I was selling my body, even though I was destroying my body as many times as I, as I could do at that moment. But his love is so unconditionary and he still loves me every day. I'm ashamed that I used to be a person like that. I can't even call myself a person. It's sad. It's really, really sad. God is bigger than that. I was captive of one thing, she was a captive of another thing. But God wants to set the captives free.
Having reached the end of our journey, it became very clear that a new one was just beginning. Our eyes have been opened to our world in a way we have never seen it before. The people we met, the faces we saw, and the stories we heard have made us different and changed the course of our lives. We have been struck with a wound that we pray we never recover from. Famous abolitionist William Wilberforce once said, if to be feeling alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures is to be a fanatic, then I am one of the most incurable fanatics ever permitted to be at large. In addition to his tireless legislative work, we looked at three things Wilberforce did that were so effective at combating slavery. Number one is prayer. He understood slavery to be a spiritual battle and he paved the way for abolition through prayer. The second thing was awareness. He thrust the injustice of slavery into the conscience of a nation. Third, he gave money. He was a generous financial supporter of the efforts to combat slavery. The crisis of modern day sex slavery does not need interested observers. It needs incurable fanatics. <laughs> 